Welcome back. This is Mr. Cook. Today we are going to go into Renaissance Theater. This lecture goes along with the chapter in the textbook. If you don't have the textbook, it is posted online. You'll read pages 448 to 451 on Renaissance Theater. The purpose of this, our essential question, is we're going to study what did the Renaissance contribute to theater. It is a lot. It is probably the birthplace of what we nowadays consider theater. Our objective is we're going to learn the theater forms and styles that were born and came from the Renaissance. So by the end of the class, you'll have read the book, you'll have enjoyed my amazing lecture, and there'll be a short quiz afterwards. So the word Renaissance means rebirth in France, which is a good thing. It started about the 15th and 16th century. Remember, after Rome and Greek fell, there was a long period of nothing, and then the church rebooted theater, mostly for the religious stuff. And then as the church rebooted it, it became popular, it moved into the streets, it became more extravagant with the passion plays and, set, and special effects. This caused it to become more secular, meaning less about church, more about people in themselves. Also, in society, what happened is the philosophy and the literature and a lot of the intellectual ideas from Greek and Rome came out of hiding. As people moved away from the church, they could begin restudying the stuff which the church had banned. And they liked what they saw. It believed in public education, so people became more educated. People became more creative. And this idea of everybody should learn, and there's all these different areas to learn, and all these new philosophies and history to learn, spread across Europe. It was a very fast activity. The arts and sciences, which at this time were linked together, grew rapidly. This is why we remember people like Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, who were considered artists, but they were also engineers and scientists. Probably the hot spot would be Italy. And in Italy, they had developed a specific form of theater called Commedia dell'arte. And this came from the mimes and the pantomimes who were performing in the streets. And they copied a lot of what they found from the Roman comedies, which, remember, were a little bit raunchy and quite intense on drama. When they performed, they wore half masks, very stylish masks, so you know who the characters were. Remember... When they performed, it wasn't on a TV. You couldn't do a close-up. So if you were stuck way back in the crowd, if you looked at a guy's mask, and these were exaggerated masks with the monstrously big nose, big decorations, you could go like, oh, I know that big nose. That is this character. Comedio del Arte, they, they were professional improvisation groups, sort of like Saturday Night Live or Second City. And they performed in the streets for the masses, for everybody. As a company, traditionally a Commedia del Arte company consisted of seven men and three women. Yes, you heard correctly. Women were finally allowed in theater. Now remember, theater was kind of a shameful endeavor. Most people kind of looked down on actors as much as they enjoyed watching them. So to be a woman, you, you kind of got um, insulted twice. When they performed in the streets, they did a lot of ad lib, which means make stuff up on the spot. Their plays had lots of action, because that would draw crowds. They had to learn dialogue, jokes they had memorized, routines and stories. They did song and they had dance, so they were all encompassing. The actors who studied this had to be very inventive. They made stuff up in the spots. They had to be very clever, very smart, funny. And they had to be agile because there was a lot of stunts involved, a lot of physical comedy, a lot of fight scenes. And a lot of dances. It was very aerobic. Most of their stories were around, were love stories that involved a lot of intrigue. The famous lovers triangles and cheating girlfriends and cheating wives or thinking people are in cheating or following love with somebody who's already in love. That kind of intrigue. 
I mentioned before they wore masks. Well, Commedia dell'arte had stock characters in one way you could recognize them from the mask. And then their costumes. Their costumes were loud and extravagant. Let me go over a couple of them. Probably the one name you would probably recognize the most now is Harlequin. The first picture is probably what popped in your mind when I said Harlequin. She derived from the second character you see in the series here, who is the comic book Harlequin, who is well known because of her hat and her very stylized costume. She comes from the Commedia de Arte Harlequin, who wore patches and it very became a stylized diamond pattern. So if you were in the audience, you saw the diamond costume, you'd go like, oh, that's the character Harlequin. Harlequin was always a servant who was very clever and witty kind of manipulating things and sort of the servant who knew everything that was going on. A couple other stock characters in almost all the Perot, I mean all the Commedia de Arte, there was Perot, who was always lovelorn and moody. Lovelorn means they're sort of lovesick. They're the kind of guys or the girls who sit on the sideline and go, oh, I'm so in love with so-and-so. I wish they would notice me. So they're easy to manipulate. Columbine, who is always the pretty and flirtatious female. And Pantaloon, who is the gullible father, easy to trick, would believe what you told him. He, also, he was well known for wearing the baggy trousers, which these baggy trousers were called pantaloons, and they still are in fashion when we get to the big puffy things. Those are still called pantaloons. That comes from Commedia del Arte. There were several other stock characters, but I'm not going to go into all of them. These were the main ones. A couple side notes before we leave Italy. Is Commedia dell'arte largely influenced a Frenchman by the name of Moyer, who we will cover later in the lecture. Moyer is one of the pinnacles of the Renaissance. At this time, remember, Commedia dell'arte was performed in the streets. For people who wanted to go inside, Italian opera started beginning in this period. And Italian opera would grow to be an amazing event involving extravagant costumes, which they kind of steal from Commedia dell'arte. But the venues they build for it are amazing architect achievements and a high form of art in itself. So the birth of opera. Moving over to Spain, Spanish theater was, was coming off. It was influenced from Commedia de Arte in the street, but the Spaniards were less interested in the intrigue and comedy and slapstick that you would find in Commedia de Arte, and they were more interested in drama, especially serious dramas. Spain was the birthplace in the Renaissance of many famous playwrights, all of whom we study today for their plays and their literatures. The first you probably know is Miguel de Cervantes. He's famous for writing Don Quixote. But he also was a playwright, and he had over 30 plays that were out there floating around. The next was Lope de Vega. He was very prolific. He wrote over 2,000 plays. Um, many are still very popular, and they were about adventure and romance. The third one I'd like to cover is Calderon. He wrote 200 plays. Most of them had a spiritual emphasis. He liked you to think about God and the church and society and his dramas. Now, a thing to remember, especially in Spain, is these plays were an original art form. Nobody had seen anything this way, written this way before. We had the influence of Greek and Roman, which followed the aesthetics laid out by Socrates and Plato. They followed a very specific form and formula when they wrote the plays. The church had set topics and also very specific ways they wrote. These gentlemen, sort of wrote it the way they want, very intellectually. Their plays had very beautiful dialogue. It was almost poetry, which also made it easier to memorize. Their stories centered around action, adventure, romance, and a lot of chivalry, which is the code of ethics. 
not necessarily the one established by the church. So they liked thinking drama, and they came up with their own way of writing in verse. Brand new for the masses. Over in France, they had not yet at the beginning joined the Renaissance. They were late to it, almost 200 years late to it. The problem with France, if you look at a map, France is pretty centrally located in Europe. It's hard to go anywhere in and out of Europe without going through France, which means France was involved in many wars. And if they weren't involved in a war, a war was marching through them. France only had one theater group because they only had one playwright. The government really kind of cracked down on it and controlled what people could see. So they allowed one state government group and they had one big public playhouse and that group was the only group that happened that had access to it. Um, when I mentioned they came late, France probably came into the Renaissance about the 17th century. What came out of France, though, is a phrase we call neoclassicism. You hear about this in philosophy. You hear about this a lot in history. In theater, what it meant, it meant the dramatists, the writers, and the performers followed a form they called the classical unities. And the reason it's called neoclassicism is classic education. When we say in the Renaissance, the classic, they meant following the thoughts and the philosophies of the Greeks and Rome. So they followed the classic unities as laid out by Plato and Socrates and the Greeks and the Romans. So they wrote a very restricted way, a very restricted course, kind of like the rules of poetry. It says you have to have this many lines, this many words, this rhyming scheme. That's how their theater and their playwrights were laid out. For it to be considered a play, it had to follow this verse. It was also, remember, one group, one playhouse. It was written largely for royalty. The common man saw very little of French theater. You had to be um, a member of the royal families or well-connected in order to be invited into their one playhouse to watch French theater. However, if you did get inside, their playhouses were highly ornate, very, very decorated. This also kind of went back to Greek. They rediscovered a lot of Greek um, architecture. So if you look at a lot of the buildings, you see a lot of the columns, you see a lot of the, the headings look very Greek and Roman because they rediscovered it. They brought it up a step because they would wa it would be have very elaborate carvings in it. They built out of wood. They'd be washed and covered with gold inlay. They had wood covered seats. They had drapes that could open and close and were very ornate. They kind of followed the Italian tradition of a lecture surrounding for the nobles because, once again, theater was for the nobles. And I mentioned before, in Italy, opera was getting going, and their playhouses were very, very ornate. Since France got there late, they kind of started stealing the idea. They wanted things to look good. If you're rich, you want to go to a place that looks rich. The high points of the Renaissance, which came out of France, was a gentleman by the name of Moyer. He's considered especially the high point of the French Renaissance. He wrote satire, making fun of stuff. All of his stuff is still widely performed. I'll cover a few of his plays lately. You can go see it. His real name was Jean-Baptiste Poquin. He had to change his name. If I mentioned before, working in theater was kind of considered shameful. He was from a well-to-do family. He didn't want to disgrace his family name. He began as an actor, actually as a Commedia dell'arte actor. Wasn't, com wasn't completely banned from France. People still like their street performers. A couple of his plays that are still widely performed and widely studied would be A Doctor in Spite of Himself, a satire of the medical field about a guy who finds himself being considered a doctor. Remember, medicine back then was very different than medicine now. Tartuffe, which makes fun of hypocrisy. Um, people who like social cliques. A lot of the stuff in it will apply to these little social groups you find in high school. He makes fun of the kind of people who are in that, how much of what they say kind of falls back on them and is very hypocritical. The imaginary invalid makes fun of hypochondriac. 
Hypochondria is people who are not sick but think they're sick and want to get attention. All three of these are comedies. All three of these make fun of certain types of people, society, and certain types of profession. They are still widely performed today. Little side note on Moyer. Even though he's well known as being a playwright, I mentioned he started as a comedian and art actor, and he stuck to acting. The irony is he actually died on stage. After doing a performance of the imaginary invalid, he collapsed and ended up dying. What a way for an actor to go. Now to wrap this up, Italy, Spain, and then later France made huge advancements in Renaissance theater. Huge advancements in much of the Renaissance. It covers more than just theater. However, the base laid by Italy, Spain, and France was picked up by Italy, who turned it on its heads and toes, and really is going to take drama and theater to the staggering height. So next time, we will be going to England and finding the birth of what is largely American theater now. If you have any questions, again, leave me a message on the webpage, or you can always Again, get me at my working email, jcook at sisd.net. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I'll catch you next time for the next one.